Great to be with you all today. My name is Kevin Rowland. I'm with Jordy Labs. I'm the laboratory manager. And today we're going to be talking a little bit more about extractables and leachables analysis. And specifically, we're going to dive into some advanced differential analysis techniques for extractables and leachables. But first, a quick overview of Jordy Labs. Uh, our company was founded almost 40 years ago and since then has been focusing on polymer analysis, specifically in the area of extractables and leachables as well as investigative analysis, which includes uh, topics such as discoloration, cracking, or other failure analyses. Today, we're going to focus on two things. First, a brief summary of what an extractables and leachables analysis is. And then second, we're going to look at our differential analysis workflow. And really, the key concept here is going to be the advantages of automated feature detection and differential analysis in those extractables and leachables. So first, what are extractables and leachables? Extractables and leachables are different, and from the uh, ISO 10993 Part 12 guidance, uh, we get their definitions. And leachables are generally defined as those chemicals which originate from packaging or devices or other equipment that wind up in a medical product and may therefore be exposed to patients. Where extractables are those compounds that might come from a packaging or food contact surface or processing equipment. And those extractables are generally found by using conditions which are more aggressive than the expected use condition of that device. Common examples of extractables and leachables include process impurities, residual monomers. Uh, they also include small molecule additives that are present in polymer systems, as well as oligomers, which originate from the bulk polymer. Now, our analysis is going to attempt to use a wide range of extraction conditions such that we cover a lot of ground for the potential leachables that might be in a particular system. And then hopefully, if our, our study was designed well, we will capture all of those leachables in one or more of those extraction conditions. So today, we're going to talk about a little bit of data that comes from a case study that we performed on a portion of silicone tubing which might have been used in the manufacturing of a drug product. Now this tubing was medical grade GMP silicone, uh, which was peroxide cured. So in our ENL analysis, we're going to include a lot of different techniques, and those will be tailored such that we can detect and identify as many different types of analytes as possible. So we'll use something like Headspace GCMS for very volatile and volatile compounds. We'll use liquid injection GCMS for semi-volatiles and volatiles. We'll use QTOF LCMS for non-volatile and semi-volatile ionizable compounds, and then something like ICPMS for elemental analysis. Today, we're going to focus just on QTOF LCMS, which again was for non-volatile and semi-volatile ionizable components. So in LCMS data, it's important to recognize that mass spectral data is three-dimensional. We're used to seeing chromatograms, which represent the abundance of the signal against retention time. And you'll see peaks in that chromatogram, and those peaks are generally identified. But what can often be overlooked is in the third dimension, there's a, a vast amount of data in the mass spectrum at each of those data points, and that is the MZ values. So if we look at some example data from our 50% ethanol extract of the tubing that we just saw a few minutes ago. We can see uh, a representative peak here, and we've collected some spectra across that peak. And we can see how the spectra change uh, with time, or with retention time. And we have a full spectrum at each of those data points. So once we have that data, we have really three major goals in an ENL analysis. And the first goal is to find compounds uh, in often those ENL extracts are very complicated. Here we have a chromatogram of a relatively complicated extract, which shows a large number of peaks. Uh, and some of those peaks appear clearly to be overlapping, and they're not completely separated chromatographically. So one of the major challenges in an ENL analysis is to find all of the components that may be present in a complex matrix. Second, we'll want to filter out any background components that may be there. Uh, since we're using highly sensitive instrumentation, there is inevitably going to be some background contribution, and that could be from any number of sources. And we want to make sure that we don't identify any of those background components as actual extractables from a particular sample set. 
And finally, we're going to want to group what are called mass features into distinct compounds. Uh, here we're looking at a spectrum from a particular retention time in the 50% ethanol extract of the tubing that we saw a minute ago. And you can see we have a large number of ions. Now those ions aren't necessarily individual components. They may be uh, adducts or fragments of a single component. And we want to make sure that we group together all of those ions that are representing a component together so that they're not uh, erroneously identified as unique components. So if we take a look again at our relatively complicated chromatogram and we look at this region uh, that's highlighted and we ask the question how many compounds are there here and obviously we see a large number of relatively intense sharp peaks sticking up above that range and then we have some sort of baseline disturbance that's going on there as well. Now most analytical workflows are going to require a scientist to take a look at all of the mass spectra in this region and manually decide which ions represent individual components. And that may be easy for those sharp peaks, but in that region where we have uh, baseline disturbance, it's going to be very difficult. Now the differential analysis that we're going to describe uh, in, in detail later automates this process and makes the detection of components that are present in complex matrices much less error prone. And if we sort of skip to the punchline here, we can see differential analysis on this particular chromatogram, and we can see the large number of components that are present under that baseline disturbance. And that's due to the presence of an oligomeric species, which tend to show a large number of different but related compounds. And the presence of those types of materials in ENL analysis makes accurate uh, accounting of the number of compounds there difficult. So if we take a step back and look at a more simple case, this is another portion of that 50% ethanol extract of the tubing. And here we can clearly see the red peak that's unique to the sample chromatogram, where we have the blue control extract showing those that are potential background components. Now, if we're going to manually identify this component, we will want to extract two spectra, one from the reference chromatogram and one from the actual peak. And here is the result of that, and we have uh, these two spectra. And if we carefully examine the two of them, we can see maybe one, two, three, uh, four different potential ions representing extractable components in this uh, particular one peak. And this is a single section of a relatively complex chromatogram. So if we move further with those ions selected and we perform molecular formula generation, we end up with three seemingly related compounds and one that's different. Now, the different one appears to be a long chain amine with the formula C16H35N. And then we have these three potentially related compounds, two of which show best matching formula of C8H18O3, which is consistent with this um, pegylated butyl ether. And then we see another component at MZ107, which shows the formula C4H10O3. Now, if we're astute when we're doing this analysis, we will recognize that that is almost certainly a fragment of the larger butyl ether um, because we are looking at a single retention time. And the reverse phase chromatography that's performed here would be highly unlikely to show this um, diethylene glycol component at the same retention time as the butyl ether. Uh, our methodology that we use should be able to easily separate those two components. So the fact that they are co-eluting almost necessarily means that, they are, that the smaller one is a fragment of the larger. So that was a relatively simple case where we could clearly see a large peak in the BPC, but what if there isn't a peak in the base peak chromatogram? What if the compound is buried underneath something else? So if we look again at, at the peak indicated in the middle, and we ask the question, how many compounds are here? We can pull a mass spectrum, and we can see two relatively intense ions. But what if we looked at this relatively low abundance region, um, which is obscured a little bit in our view because of those high abundance compounds? Well, if we zoom in on those ions, we can see that they are a pair of adducts, which are consistent with C23H. 2808. 
And if we go a little bit further and, and generate some extracted ion chromatograms specific to those ions, we can see that indeed there is a chromatographic peak, that small purple one, underneath the very large blue main component. So it, it is very difficult to manually pick out that type of signal because, number one, those ions are, are relatively obscured from view uh, when, when looking at this data manually because of the intense signal of the more abundant compound. So let's take a look at our differential analysis workflow. And there's really four major parts to that type of analysis. And the first is the same that we've been talking about. We want to find compounds. And, and we've mentioned how to do that manually. But we want to do it in a more efficient way. And we want to do it in a way that's less error prone. So we're going to use software. And the software that, that's being used uses an algorithm that's called molecular feature extraction. And what happens is. The, the software looks at all of the ions in the third dimension in our chromatogram and tries to look for changes in their signal that appear to be chromatographic peaks. And those ions will then be grouped together as individual compounds. The peaks that we see will be integrated from their extracted compound chromatograms. We'll then be able to eliminate any ions that aren't related to those compounds and then average spectra across the entire peak, generating better averaged data. So again, looking at this one peak that we've been looking at, at a lot today, we can see the six spectra that are generated. If, if we send this data to our molecular feature extraction algorithm, we can see the result here. We clearly have the green integrated peak, which represents the major component here. And then we also have the compound spectrum. You'll see that all of the extraneous ions have been removed. And we've isolated these four different ions that all appear to be related to a single compound. We have the M plus proton and M plus uh, sodium adducts, as well as the 2M plus proton and 2M plus sodium adducts. Now, if we were to do this manually, it may be very easy to miss the fact that those higher mass ions are, in fact, related to the lower mass ones. So the second step of our differential analysis workflow is to perform what's called recursive analysis. And what we're going to do there is first we're going to align the compounds that we see. Compounds with similar mass and similar re retention time within a certain uh, criteria that we set are going to be recognized as being the same, and they'll be combined together. And once we've done that, we can look at a master list of all of those compounds that were detected in our entire study. And we can go back to each one of the individual data files and search those data files for compounds which may not have been identified or detected in the first pass. But now that we know what's in all of the other extracts from the study, we can look for them specifically. So here we have one compound that was observed in a single sample set. And then we're going to apply that compound through recursion to a series of other sample sets. And you can see that in the first two cases, we have a relatively big peak. And those peaks were probably identified in the first pass. But in the second two, we have a relatively weak signal that shows some additional noise. And that peak may have been missed in the initial analysis. So this recursion helps us eliminate uh, any false negatives. Now, the third step of our differential analysis is going to be comparison of samples with controls or samples with other samples. And we're going to do that in a couple of different ways. And it's easiest to visualize this in the plot that we have here on the right. This plot is um, showing individual components as data points. And we're grouping them together by color, uh, which are fitting a couple of different criteria. The ones on the right shown in red are those that are seen at higher abundance in the sample as compared to this particular control. The ones in the middle in green are ones that do not show significant difference in intensity. And the ones on the left in blue are the ones that happen to be at higher abundance in the blank for whatever reason. And now we have uh, another series of compounds that are shown in gray at the bottom which may or may not be higher or lower in either one of the blank or control uh, or sample. But those were found to have abundance values that 
were variable enough such that they were not found to be statistically significant. So we're going to perform a statistical analysis on their abundance and decide at what level uh, we want to call those changes in abundance statistically significant in our study. So once we've done that, we can take a look at our actual data from our tubing extractables. And this is a Venn diagram showing the three different extraction solvents that were performed on that sample that we saw earlier, the um, silicone tubing. Uh, we have a 50-50 water ethanol extract, an aqueous extract buffered at pH 10, and another aqueous extract buffered at pH 3. And we can see for, that, for this sample, we had a total of 23 uh, identified unique compounds. And they were all detected in the 50-50 ethanol water mixture where only a selection of them were seen in the pH 10 and pH 3. Now if we add to that data a leachables condition, in this case it was PBS buffer, and compare that to the extractables that we just saw, we still have the same 23 entities and out of those five were found in the PBS buffer solution, our mock leachables situation. So in this case we do have a reasonably good study we were able to identify all of those potential leachables under this condition with the extractables conditions that were chosen. Now the final step of our differential analysis workflow is identification and confirmation of those uh, identified compounds. Now identification at Jordi Labs is going to be performed with um, three major steps. First we're going to use our extensive additives and polymer database. Uh, we're then maybe going to use the Agilent Extractables and Leachables database. And finally, since we're using high resolution mass spectrometers, we're able to perform molecular formula generation and calculate the molecular formula for compounds that were observed. And after we've done that, we're going to confirm those identities um, using a, a lot of different tools, one of which is high resolution MSMS fragmentation. Uh, we may analyze some reference standards, and we may use an orthogonal technique such as soft EI QTOF GCMS for LCMS data. So if we look again at the results from our tubing extract, we have here a selection of those compounds that were identified, and we can compare what a reasonable uh, number of them would be uh, detectable through manual interpre interpretation and those that were detected using this automated differential analysis approach. And you can see that here in three cases we were missing components that were present in the tubing extracts manually uh, that were easily identified by the differential analysis and those included um, this diisopropylamine, a small molecule, as well as a whole series of different siloxane oligomers that appear to have an alkyl chain on their end. Those uh, in addition to an alkyl ethoxylate were not detectable manually. So to wrap up here, uh, we've proposed that complex extracts in ENL analysis are challenging. Uh, the data is complex and three-dimensional and manual interpretation of that data is error-prone. And I hope that we've shown that differential analysis will significantly increase the accuracy of compound identification and the number of compounds present, uh, also reduce false negatives, and again improve identifications because we're able to use a larger data set and average that data together to get better mass spectra. Thank you all for your time.